Thank you all. Thank you very much. Especially thank you for my uh, to my volunteers. <clears throat> so uh, welcome everyone. Uh, today I am going to be talking about uh, about Sprockets. It's a library that you might have heard of, might have used. Uh, Sprockets came out in May of 2011 or the asset pipeline came out in May of 2011 as part of um, Rails 3.1. Now, uh, Sprockets basically is the asset pipeline, if you're not familiar, and Sprockets came first. So uh, before we get uh, too carried away with ourselves, I did want to mention that um, on the internet, I go by Schneems. You can find me at Schneems with everything. If you don't know how to pronounce that, it sounds like schnapps. <clears throat> Uh, I took a train to get here from Austin, Texas. It was amazing. Uh, and it only took 28 hours. <laughs> there was no Wi-Fi. Uh, I, I work for a small startup you might have heard of called Heroku. Uh, and um, by the way, any likenesses to any Disney-owned prop properties, totally coincidental, and also parody. And uh, by the way, when I mentioned that, uh, you know, my name was Schneems. If you're a lawyer in the audience, you can refer to me by my full name, which is actually a DHH. <laughs> so, uh, and this talk will be intensely about open source, but I did want to mention you don't need to look like Indiana Jones to do open source. Um, if you want to, you know, that's fine. But Indiana Jones is my uh, sprocket spirit animal. If you're wondering, like, why is this guy doing this? It makes no sense. So uh, from 2011 to 2016, Sprockets has about 51 million downloads from RubyGems. To compare and contrast, Rails has about 65 million. So Rails is winning, but not by much. <clears throat> One developer is responsible for over 2,000 commits on Sprockets, which accounts for about 68% of the entire code base. Compare and contrast with Rails, we have our top contributor, Raphael, who is at about almost 6,000 commits, and that accounts for just less than 1% of Rails. So you can kind of see the, uh, the difference in the two code bases. So 51 million downloads, just one developer, and one day Josh is just like, not doing this anymore, cutting the cord, getting out of here. <clears throat> when this happens, what should we do? Should we just completely abandon Sprockets? I mean, who 100% Sprockets is like your favorite library of all time. Raise your hand. Let the record show, no hands went up. <laughs> okay, so um, people don't love Sprockets, but should we just abandon it? Well, before you're gonna abandon something um, and just say, oh, we're gonna rewrite it, we have to know what the problems are. We can't fix what we can't define. Because a, re a rewrite would assume that we know better, and we just don't. Assets, asset generation, are relatively easy. It's all of those um, edge cases that just pop up. Um, Sprockets also has an established API, has been around for a while, has a bunch of tests. So um, brief show of hands, I'm actually expecting hands to go up this time. Uh, how many of you maintain code? <laughs> okay, that was a lot, I think all of you, most of you. Uh, how many of you want to maintain it forever? <laughs> no, 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 look. <clears throat> Okay, so we can clearly see that we're gonna lose maintainers. Losing maintainers is inevitable, but it's not always 100% uh, expected. We can't always plan on when, when it's gonna happen. So I have a couple, of, uh, a couple of rules when we're dealing with maintainers. Rule number one is that a maintainer does not owe you anything. <clears throat> and you might say, oh yeah, I use Sprockets all the time. I've been using it since like you know, 2011. Like This person left and I deserve an explanation. Um, you don't, you are not even owed an explanation. Um, if you are maintaining something or someone is maintaining something, leaving a project is a very personal decision. Um, to the point where actually Josh didn't even want to talk about this. I, I like emailed him many times. Somebody jokingly said like, oh, he probably just has a, a filter in his Gmail that's just like if you use the word sprockets, it's like straight to spam. Um, 
Yeah, he's still in tech, still alive, still well. I've gotten a pull request from him, which is kind of interesting. Um, and I, w I do want to talk a lot about uh, respect and respecting what, uh, what people have done. So rule number two is going to be that you owe a maintainer respect. And you might just be working with uh, software any given day um, and just be like, oh, I really hate blank. You know, it really makes my life very, very hard. Um, but it's not the end of the world. It is, it is possible to critique the software that you're using without demonizing their creators. And throughout this talk, I'm going to critique the crap out of Sprockets. But uh, note that I am going to try and avoid, um, avoid criticism. And I'm going to try to keep things uh, wrapped up and productive. Because when, when Sprockets originally kind of fell into my lap and somebody said, hey, like, do you want to take on more of a maintenance role of Sprockets? Uh, my literal first thought was, sprockets. Why did it have to be sprockets? <laughs> and then, you know, I, I, I kind of got over that and um, did a lot of thinking in, in soul searching. And I want to I say that um, in terms of not demonizing software creators, even if you don't like that software, you are not your software. You are not the things that you create. Uh, and Josh gave years of his life to this, years of his life to that, you know, this endeavor. 68% of the entire code base, um, so many millions of downloads. So uh, I do want to thank Josh for making Sprockets, I think. Yeah? OK, that brings me to rule number three, that words without actions are empty. Um, I want you to be actionable. Here we have a Hacker News post, the, uh, yeah. Uh, and it's a release of Node.js uh, Node where they are saying, hey, ES6 features are supported. The, the top comment at the time I viewed it was, unless they add async await, I see it as ugly and barely usable. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's not helping. Like, people in the real world are actually seeing these. The developer who worked on that. Instead, you could, you could say, ES6 is, support is great. You did a great job. I love it. It looks like you don't have this feature, and I really need that feature because of this very valid reason. I can't wait until you get that. Can you maybe prioritize it? Or, hey, where can I help out? When, you're, when you are doing these things, ask yourself, is my comment adding anything? Because when we, we in tech, tend to feel alone and powerless, and so we, we use hyperbole so much. Like, this is the worst thing ever. It's not the worst thing ever. Um, so please be honest and be productive, because complaining accomplishes nothing. All right, so uh, with software maintenance, how do we keep a maintainer longer? Or if you were ma maintaining something, how do you stay as a maintainer longer? Before we get into that, I want to back up and ask the question, do we want our maintainers to stay? Do we want them to stick around? Because a maintainer. We, we are going to lose them eventually. It's just a matter of time. But are they going to just peace out? Is it going to be a mic drop? Are we never going to hear from them again? Or is it going to be kind of a graceful handoff where they say, here you go. I'm going to be around if you have any questions, but over there. So uh, while I'm working with Sprockets, pretty much on a day-by-day -day basis, I look at some code, and I'm like, this is insane. <laughs> I'm going to totally change this. I can't read this. I don't understand this. Six hours later, I have to like revert all of my changes, and I'm like, wow, that was really maybe a little bit too clever, but totally genius. Like That was a really good way of doing it. I actually can't improve upon it. And, and the thing I'm missing a lot of is history. And I, I really want to uh, express that maintainers are historians, and maintainers bring context. Uh, please write good commit messages. Please put effort into your pull request messages. Please keep a change log. But all of those things don't compare to somebody who was actually there when the code was written. A story is worth a thousand commit messages. Uh, and to see why, you can't ask a commit message a question. Later on, you, you come across a really well-written commit message, and you're like, oh, hey, did you also consider adding this other thing that, uh, or doing it this other way? And the commit message is going to be like, no, I'm a commit message. So I think we want maintainers to stick around. <clears throat> and we can keep those maintainers by giving them the things that they want. Maintainers want respect. They also want help. I know what you're thinking right now. You're like, oh my gosh, now's the time when he's going to ask me for help. Totally do not have time to help. That's not a thing I have. <clears throat> I need those five minutes to snap to face to force to gram. They're critical to my, to my well-being. So if you have those five minutes, then you have five minutes to help out. 
It doesn't take much, you can contribute to documentation, just even reading the guides. It's like you're reading the guides and you find a typo. Guess what, you can fix that typo. Ah, oh, yeah, you helped. Um, if you're using a library and you found surprising behavior, was that behavior documented anywhere? Was it in the method docs? Was it in the guides? Could it be? Um, if it could, then you can add it to the guide. If you've got five minutes to help, you can submit a bug report. And please, please, if you haven't ever submitted a bug report, just because you come up with unexpected behavior, don't assume, oh, I'm using Rails, it's got 65 million downloads, I'm sure 11 million people of, you know, of those 65 have already reported this problem. They haven't. I don't know your app is broken. I'm not gonna fix it unless I know that it's broken and why. So um, if you have five minutes to help, I also have a service that I, I, um, I wrote called Code Triage, and it helps people get involved in open source. Um, it will send you an open issue uh, of a project of your choosing to your inbox every day. And the idea is that you can take some work off of the maintainer. So you get an issue, a GitHub issue in your inbox, and you can ask common questions. You can say, hey, okay, this is broken now. Was it working previously? What versions are you using? Um, because at the end of the day, would you rather a maintainer spend their time actually fixing those bugs? Or would you rather that they spent a bunch of time saying, all right, you know, okay, what operating system are you on? Like, what version of Ruby? <clears throat> Personally, I would rather they actually worked on features. Uh, and so the idea here is that if you give it a minute of your time, then you will save a minute of maintainer's time. And if you don't, like, literally nobody else will. Um, they're just gonna be kind of sitting there being like, wow, I, you know, it sure is lonely here as a maintainer. I wish I had somebody to you know, take a look at this bug report with me. Um, it also has some really cool side benefits that it exposes you to different parts of different projects. It's gonna help you grow as a developer. <clears throat> and uh, if, you have, uh, if you have 10 minutes to help, I highly, highly uh, recommend including an example app to reproduce a problem, just as an exercise. If you take nothing else away from this talk, know that example apps are amazing and make the development open source world um, go around. If you don't know what I'm talking about, there's a lot of times people open up, will open up an issue and be like, hey, uh, this thing breaks. First, you're gonna run Rails new, and then they submit, and then, you know, okay, I try to reproduce it, and then it didn't work. And I get back to them, and I'm like, hey, that didn't work. What else am I missing? They're like, oh, yeah, 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 I forgot you have to do this, and be on, you know, this version, and I try again, and it wouldn't work, and then more time goes by, and they say, oh, yeah, 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 I also forgot to mention this thing, and we keep on going back and forth, and it, it takes a lot of their time, it takes a lot of my time, and instead, you can say, hey, here's an application that reproduces my problem. This is the, just run this command, and you will see my problem. I put it up on GitHub, github.com slash username slash example app. Not picky, you can use example app too if you want, it's okay. <clears throat> I'll allow it. Uh, and sure, does it take a little bit of your time and a little bit more thought than just being like, it broke when I did this vague command? Yes, but the idea here is that you're giving a minute and you're saving a minute of maintainer's time. So my, my personal challenge to you is wait, make uh, one example app this year just as a general blanket challenge. Example apps are awesome, don't forget. Okay, if you have 30 minutes to help, you can try fixing your bug or a bug. I'm not saying that in 30 minutes you can fix every bug in the world, but just time box it. Even if you don't actually fix the bug, I guarantee that you're gonna learn something. You're gonna figure out some new parts of the, of the project, you're gonna have some new questions, and you're gonna read other people's code. <clears throat> reading other people's code and working with other people's code tends to bring uh, about navigating and debugging skills, and it turns out that navigating code and debugging code is highly marketable. Um, you know, ask what separates a senior developer from somebody who just came out of a boot camp. Can you be put into a project with thousands and thousands of lines of code of somebody else's, have no idea what's going on, and still be semi-productive? Um, these, are, these are things you can pick up by working on open source bugs. Now, I love, I don't know if you've seen the t-shirts, but it's like club soda, I think. Is that, is that what that is? Or is this, so I have, I totally had this stick about club soda in here beforehand. I love club soda. Uh, my biggest problem with club soda is that I don't like fitting 12 cans into my refrigerator. It takes a lot of space, but I love cold club soda. So what I do is every single time I take one out of my refrigerator to drink it, 
then I put another one in. And I noticed this trend, this strange, strange trend. Even though I'm always putting one can back in, I would sometimes open my refrigerator and there'd be no club soda. So I think maybe my dog is sneaking in there, I don't know, house guests. In, in reality, it's like even though I think I'm doing it every single time, I'm probably forgetting about half the time. And so I changed my behavior so that whenever I do remember, I just put two cans of club soda in the refrigerator every single time. And now, it's not something I do, obviously, every time I open up the refrigerator. Otherwise, it would just be like exponentially increasing, like, or linearly increasing. You get the point. Um, but I, my, the point of the story is that you don't always have to fix that bug. You don't always have to submit that bug report. But every once in a while, whenever, whenever it, that idea occurs to you, you know, go the extra mile. If you were going to submit a bug report, well, submit a bug report and create an example app. If you were already going to create an example app, create an example app and try to fix the bug. Um, you'll, be, uh, you'll be really pleasantly surprised by, by how it turns out. Water break. OK, so um, <clears throat> we talked about what, uh, what developers, what maintainers want. And we talked about the value of maintainers. Now, what, how do we make the transition of moving from one maintainer to another a little bit easier? Well, what is a maintainer? A maintainer is somebody who knows the stories behind the code. We talked about this. They know the history. A maintainer is somebody who's going to take five minutes, take 10 minutes, 30 minutes out of their day, and they're going to help, right? And, and the act of doing that, the act of helping, means that you are around and you are hearing more stories, more history. You're going to be able to preserve more history. So it turns out that helping out with projects is the key to keeping maintainers around for longer. It's also the key to creating new maintainers because when you do those things, you are, as a matter of fact, actually becoming a, even if it's like a mini maintainer, um, you, you are helping to do those things. So now the question is, how can we foster a culture for helping? How can we make it better and easier? Well, previously, we asked, what do maintainers want? Now, I want to ask, what do helpers want? What, what <clears throat> if you're going to get involved with a project, what are things that would make it easier? Uh, documentation, helpers want docs, they want sane code, they want essentially the same things that regular users want. Um, helpers want a good user experience, they want non-magical code, they want backwards compatibility, good deprecations, uh, reliable tests. So these are, these are all things that, that we can add to our project. Now I want, I want to take a look at, um, at sprockets and kind of ask, ask the question, um, well, you know, sprockets only had one maintainer for so long, like, why? Let's take a look at, um, at docs. So Sprockets actually has, it's kind of hard to see, 73% of all methods in Sprockets are documented, which is kind of a lot. Like, that's pretty good. I'm actually pretty impressed. Um, I didn't even realize it until I started working on the project. Uh, but even though those Sprockets, the methods are documented, I think that method documents are kind of like unit tests, and they do not tell your whole story. <clears throat> the, the hardest part about method documentation so that it's really easy to get out of sync with reality, and you end up with uh, scenarios like this. Yeah, says basmati rice. It's like obviously delicious cookies of some kind. Uh, so a, my spin on it is that a readme is going to tell more of a complete story. It's, a readme is kind of almost like an integration test for documentation. <clears throat> if we look at Sprocket's readme, it is pretty long. It's got you know, 2,600 words in it. So it tells a pretty long story. So now if Sprockets, if helpers love documentation and Sprockets has documentation, then why doesn't Sprockets have anybody helping? OK, well, the, the biggest problem here uh, that I, I self-diagnosed was uh, we weren't considering all of the different people using our product. And different people are going to need different documentation. Um, if you are going to use a piece of sprockets, then I don't want to make you hunt down the docs for that specific action. So to help out with this, I created sprockets guides. Um, this is a folder inside of the sprockets library, and we have a guide on building an asset processing framework. If you are the next, you know, if you wanted to add sprocket support to Django or Rails, <laughs> if you wanted to build the next asset pipeline, this is, this is what you would use. And all of how to integrate with Sprockets is right there, right at your fingertips. You don't have to hunt through a bunch of unnecessary information. 
Same with end user asset generation. Sprockets has so many um, interesting features, uh, like I'm sure you've probably used require, but there's all of these other features that it's got that I didn't even know about until I started maintaining it. It was documented, it was there, it just wasn't easily accessible. And then finally, a guide on extending Sprockets, which is um, how to build a plugin and how to, um, well, extend Sprockets. Say you want Sprockets to work with React. Well, you know, you can write a, write a Ruby gem to add that support. Uh, and this is gonna make it easier for developers to find what they need. And one, one of the things that I really like about it is that it lives in the source and is not a wiki because it's gonna change over time. And it's really nice that if you're browsing code, um, let's say you go back to Sprockets 2.x, then there's gonna be hopefully guides and, and documentation you know, on into the future uh, where you can see docs that are valid for that point in time. And at, helpers love contributing documentation. So let's make more documentation. Let's make better documentation. Um, documentation is the gateway drug to code contributions. It, it is so easy, you put like CI skip and you're like, hey, I fixed a typo. And then before you know it, you're adding paragraphs and like explaining behavior. It's like really easy. It's a really easy way to get up on that um, contributors wall on, on GitHub. <clears throat> All right, so we talked about docs. I wanna talk a little bit about sane code. And we're gonna get real for a little bit. Uh, Sprockets was designed to solve some problems, yes, generate assets, and sometimes when you're using it, it feels like, <laughs> it feels like it's making new problems. <laughs> you were supposed to save us from asset generation. Uh, people don't know why Sprockets is failing. Uh, and, and one of the reasons is that Sprockets isn't talking to developers. So how does code talk to you? It talks to you through errors, and not just like, oh, something broke, I want, like this is something broke. No route matches this thing. Okay, well why? You know, why is there an error? I want this broke. Here's a, here's a better error, because ID is, key is missing. Basically the error should be screaming out, hey, look here, this is the thing that is wrong, this is your problem, fix it please. A, a, a good error is gonna be instructive. Um, also, I want deprecations. Uh, previously, Sprockets deprecated in code comments. He would just add deprecated to the method documentation. Um, first of all, nobody's casually reading your method documentation. Like, even if you were, who was the time? Oh, I'm just gonna scan this in my, you know, five minutes. Um, and, and so if you have a, a library, you cannot just break your API without any kind of warning, um, especially when you've got 51 million plus downloads. So your code knows when some, someone is using that interface. You can yell at them for it. You can say, oh, I notice you're using this thing that is not supported pretty soon. Don't use it anymore. We're gonna, we're gonna output it to standard error. <clears throat> Sprockets 3.7 has deprecations. Here's a uh, pull request where I added some deprecations. Uh, and, and deprecations are great. They help you seamlessly transition between ma you know, relatively major changes, hopefully not too major, um, and I think that's one of the big pain points of Sprockets, is like things would just change and you have no idea why and no warning, um, and deprecations can really help people with upgrading. We're using them a lot more inside of uh, Rails core as well. Uh, so deprecations also help you good with good API design. If you can't write a very good deprecation for a feature, then it wasn't a very good interface to begin with, so maybe you shouldn't do it. So if you start thinking about deprecations now, later on, it'll be a lot easier to actually change your code and you write better code. Now, <clears throat> the, the design of Sprockets, while we're talking about code, suffers from something I call the God object problem. There's one class and tons and tons and tons of concerns. I recently wrote an article, good module, bad module, I don't know if anybody read that, but um, I was basically channeling that towards uh, this part of Sprockets, and this is amazing. Uh, there's one object with 105 methods, and frequently while you're, de while you're debugging, you say, okay, where did, you know, this, I've got this method, where did it come from? Well, to figure out, you have to look in Sprockets base, Sprockets environment, Sprockets dependencies, digest utils, HTTP utils, MIME, server, Resolve, loader, bower, path utils, path dependency utils, path digest utils, digest utils, source map utils, URI utils. <clears throat> this is my personal favorite. Sprockets has a utils module, which is mixed into Sprockets compressing, which is then mixed into Sprockets configuration, which is then included in Sprockets base, which is inherited by Sprockets environment, which is wrapped and cached by Sprockets cached environment.
Yes. So um, with this design, it's impossible to know how things are interacting just at a glance. You look at a file and you don't know where that method came from. Um, so what is a solution to God objects? Uh, we can move that logic over to helper classes. So this is a helper class that I introduced. Um, we, there's lots of places where Sprockets has a relative URI and it needs to make it a absolute URI or vice versa. It has an absolute and it needs to make it relative. And so uh, I introduced URI tar. If you're not familiar with the tar utility um, in Unix, it, you can expand and compress uh, files. And the great thing about this is that it has some methods in here that are not exposed to our overall um, God object API. It also gives us a small file that's relatively easy to understand and hopefully a little bit more readable. And readable code attracts helpers who like to read code. Um, I will also mention that Ruby is object-oriented, like at very much at its core, and if you're not really comfortable with objects, I highly recommend. Um, check out, Sandy Metz has a book called Practical Object-Oriented uh, Design for Rubyists, I guess. I can, yeah. As well as Katrina Owen has a ton of refactoring talks. Um, Exorcism.o will also give you a place where you can just practice your refactoring. And the two of them together have recently come together and are writing a book called 99 Bottles of Oop, which sounds fun to say out loud <clears throat> in front of a large audience. Uh, so this is not a object-oriented design talk, uh, but please, I encourage you to, to get some more information there. And so all of this stuff that I've talked about are kind of our ideals. You know, we talked about um, how exactly we keep maintainers and you know, why and how we get helpers, how we get started ourselves as helpers. Uh, we, need to, you know, we need to consider that maintainers are not gonna be around forever. You know, I will not be around forever. And moving on into the future, I need help. I need help to maintain the history of sprockets. I need help to preserve the stories. So, you know, this is where you, uh, you know, this is where you can get involved. If you don't get involved, like you, not, I'm not talking to like the person next to you, I'm talking to you. I know it's a confusing distinction, it's like the N plus one thing. Um, if you don't, then nobody's going to. This is something where we all need to step up. We all need to take five minutes, we can read those guides, we can write documentation, open up issues, uh, we can create example apps. I'm asking for five minutes. So please, if you will, join me, become a helper, become a maintainer. Together, we can save sprockets. Thank you very much.